session put on by University Finance Lab. Today our topic is how to design a finance lab. Um, my name is Ryan Kohoy with Rise Vision and I'll be the moderator for today's panel. Uh, we've got a couple of companies that are involved in building out finance labs. Uh, for anyone that's interested, I put the websites up there. Uh, Rise Vision does digital signage software, so formatting market data to put it up on video walls and touch screens and LCD displays. And then the LED stock tickers that you see floating around these labs is done through our Rise display side of things. So anyone interested in display technology, feel free to check out those web links and uh, learn a little bit more. Um, today's session is going to be a you know, informal roundtable conversation, and we, we definitely want to answer your questions. So as we get going through this, if you have any thoughts, you have any uh, questions, any directions you'd like us to take the conversation, please send them our way. You should see in the lower right-hand corner of your window a green button that says ask a new question and that'll allow you to pop in your questions. If for some reason you don't see that, if you mouse over the top of your screen, there's going to be nine little dots at the top. If you click on that, there's a little Q&A, it's kind of a little blue tag, and that should open the window like you see here on the screen. Um, but outside of that, if uh, you do have any problems doing Q&A this way, we're also going to moderate the Google Plus page, so the original uh, Google Events page where you started this video or you originally signed up. There's an area to ask questions. There's a little box that says say anything. Feel free to throw questions in there. And for those of you watching the recorded version, we'll continue to moderate that page. So if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in there and we'll uh, throw you our feedback and suggestions. So uh, again, uh, please ask us questions as we go through this. Um, as I mentioned, we're putting this all on through the University Finance Lab group, and there, there's a lot of great resources out on the website. So if you have a chance, or if you haven't had a chance yet, check out universityfinancelab.com. Out there, there's a directory of all the finance labs that we track across North America. So um, if you're a school and you see your listing, and maybe we don't have something quite accurate, or you want to expand on it, or maybe share a picture with us, uh, let us know. Or vice versa, if you're a school that has uh, started to build a lab or is in the process of adding one and maybe we're not listed in the directory yet, send us that information. We want to do as comprehensive of a list as we can. Right now we're tracking just a little over 300 schools across North America that have built these trading rooms out. Also on the website, you'll be able to learn a little bit more about different partners that uh, contribute uh, pieces of the puzzle to finance labs. You can learn about some of the different products. There's a really extensive gallery of different designs and room layouts. So if you're just looking for ideas of how other schools have laid things out, check out that gallery. We've also collected uh, as many research papers and articles as we can on the topic. So that's under the research section. Uh, likewise with the directory. If anybody out there has more papers that uh, maybe you don't see on that list, share them with us. We want to get as much as we can out on this website to make it as comprehensive of a resource as possible. Um, the other thing that you'll see throughout the website is we're suggesting joining a LinkedIn group. There's a little over 600 members. This is comprised of faculty, of students, of vendors, of software providers, data providers. So there, there's a pretty good cross-section of people all around the world that are involved in finance labs and trading rooms. Um, and I put up just a couple of examples of questions that have come up over the last month or so here. It's gotten to be fairly active, so if you've got questions, you're looking for feedback, or you just want to contribute, uh, again, it's just University Finance Lab. It's a wide open group on LinkedIn. You know, Please share your perspective and your thoughts with us. Um, we are trying to do these Hangouts on a monthly basis, uh, and on the website at universityfinancelab.com, there's a whole section dedicated to Hangouts. You can watch past recorded versions, and then these are the next three that we've got coming up in April, May, and June. So feel free to put those on your calendar and check them out if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Morningstar and some of the analytics programs. If you're interested in learning things like what Securities Training Corporation is doing for bringing Wall Street in there and putting in training packages. Um, and then uh, in June we'll talk more about uh, the display technology, LED tickers and video walls and how you create that Wall Street atmosphere. Also, if anybody's attending the AACSB annual conference that's in Tampa April 26th to 28th, there's going to be a nice 20 by 20 booth in there featuring uh, some of the latest desk technology, software simulations, uh, different displays, tickers. So kind of come in, get a feel for what a trading room could look like, and we'll be doing different presentations on and off throughout the show. So be for sure to check out the University Finance Lab booth at AACSB if, if you're planning to attend. Um, joining me on the call today, I've got Bruce Wells from Innovant. 
uh, known Bruce for a great number of years, and he's been intimately involved in the furniture and the desk aspects for all kinds of professional trading rooms, and you know now today working closely with a number of universities to help bring that Wall Street look to their trading rooms. And also joining joining us is Gerd Althoffer from Gerd Althoffer Consulting. Uh, Gerd brings extensive knowledge of trading rooms and the design, how to lay them out, the flow to create that right atmosphere. Again, this is a little bit different than a uh, finance lab or uh, another computer lab on campus. You want to give it more of that Wall Street or finance feel. So as we move through the conversation, we'll be gaining their perspective and their insights on uh, uh, you know just how they would design out labs and, and giving you little tidbits there. Uh, again, uh, everything that we're talking about is out on the University Finance Lab website. You know the directories, all the resources. Today's session is recorded, so that Hangout section, if you do miss parts of it or you want to share this with any of your colleagues, uh, just go out and visit by the end of the day today. You'll see in the Hangout section, um, this Hangout will be there as a recording, as well as those other ones that I mentioned in terms of future ones. And again, I, I can't stress this enough, we, we want to make this a lively and interactive conversation. So if you do have questions as we're going through this, again, please just hit that green Ask a New Question, throw your questions, your thoughts, any direction you have in there. Uh, and again, if you don't see that, you know, look for that little box towards the top of your video window with the nine dots on it and open that QA app and you, you can put your questions in there. Uh, so with that, I'm going to shift gears here and I'm going to uh, turn it over to our panel with uh, Bruce and Gerd and let them talk a little bit about uh, themselves and their background. So I'll start with you, Bruce, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you've been involved with trading rooms and uh, your expertise. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, my name Bruce Wells, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Design at Innovant. Uh, Innovant is a specialized manufacturer of uh, furniture and workstations specifically tailored for the financial community. Uh, we build the trading floors for Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, many of the major investment banks, including the hedge funds and, and other financial institutions throughout North America. Uh, me personally, I've been involved in trading desk design and manufacturing since the early 90s. Uh, and still, still slugging away at it. The, 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 the move towards taking these products that we typically sell into, into the Wall Street environment and then moving it into the finance lab is something which has become a little bit uh, more recent, um, and it's a growing popularity. So we're excited at the opportunity of expanding our offering, not just to more financial firms, but certainly to the uh, higher education community as well. So, um, Gerd? I'm Gerd Althofer. I'm an architect in New York. And uh, for the past 25 years, I have designed nothing but trading rooms for financial institutions, both here in, in the U.S. and abroad. The smallest uh, trading room I designed was for two positions in Kazakhstan, not that I ever got there. Uh, and the largest one was uh, over 1,200 positions here in New York. More recently, I've become interested and uh, begun to focus on university finance labs. Uh, you would think that they are the same as financial trading rules. They are and they aren't. Um, the main difference, or rather the, the commonality between two, is that they both use the same building blocks, a trading desk, monitor, desktop monitors, and large displays. The difference is, in a financial trading uh, environment, everybody is a professional. Everybody more or less works for themselves. Everybody wants all the information that they need to execute a trade right in front of them. In a finance lab, uh, you have a learning environment uh, where you may simulate trades, but basically you learn the trade, so to speak. Important in that regard is that um, everybody, every student can see display, all the displays. The instructor can see the students and the students can see one another. That's the important part. So it boils down basically to sight lines and large displays, common displays, uh, and how do you access those, visually access those as a student. And then secondarily, uh, the, the teaching style of the instructor, does he stand up like a lecturer at the front of the room or uh, is he roving around 
trying to, uh, to tutor students uh, one by one if need be. So th that's the large uh, difference between those two environments. Great. Well, it's perfect. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction, guys. Let's uh, let's jump right into it and let's talk a little bit about the process. And I'll, I'll start with you, Gerd. So, you know, if a school comes to you and they have no idea where to start, you know, completely blank straight slate, what's the process you step them through? You know, wh how do you encourage them to begin so that they get a, a good foundation as they move forward? Uh, like in any other project, whether it's the design of a house or an apartment or an office. I like to tell uh, clients there are three major factors to consider. One is the size of the space, two is the budget, and three is the, um, the quality of the finishes and quality of equipment. Uh, those both three factors are basically present in every project. Now. How do you design a, a, a finance lab? Where do you start? Uh, in most cases, I think you start with a space. Uh, you go around and, and see what classrooms are available, uh, what's the size, what's the, the rough size and the configuration of the space. Um, you take that as one of the factors. Then you, establish, you have to establish a budget. Largely, the budget is determined by uh, by display. Uh, that's the largest factor in lab design cost and budget. Then, as a result of all the budget, the budget in the space, you can then determine the quality of the finishes. Do you want this space to be uh, utilitarian? Well, but well-functioning space, or do you want it to be a showcase? Makes a much of a difference in terms of the total cost. So once you have these three factors together, you can then go ahead and start thinking about how to design it, because you have the, the determining factors all at hand now. Just one one quick uh, kind of follow-up to that. I'm just curious. Do you find it's easier for a school? if it's a blank slate where they're building a brand new building? Or do you find it's uh, easier if they're just renovating an existing space? Any uh, challenges to one or the other of those? Uh, well, in a, in, in a renovation of an existing space or a modification of an existing space, you always start with, the, with what you have. If you, start a, if, if you design a lab from scratch with a new building, uh, as well, you have nothing to restrict you. And in that sense, it's a little bit more difficult, but more challenging. But it's also more interesting if you have that uh, the, the choice to do that. In a in a renovation kind of th uh, situation, there's always a challenge of what's the best layout. And at this point, I would. Typically, uh, suggest to the client to commission a, a what I call a schematic design, which is part of the, the general architectural design development. It's the first step, the very limited step, concerns itself mostly with layout of the trading of the student positions. Um, It's all great information. Uh, you know, Bruce, do you have anything to add to that? I'm just curious uh, your opinion of the design process from a, a furniture well, and a desk perspective. I, yeah, we actually experience a different um, side of the process that's, that, that, that goes along with what Gert's doing and what the client experiences, and that is um, that initial stage of budget establishment is, is always difficult. So when you have to establish a budget, um, you really have to have an understanding of what are the core cost elements of of building a finance lab, and there there are a number of places to go. Uh, having someone like uh, working with you guys or with Garrett that can essentially say, you know, you have a you have a three thousand square foot room that we can construct a finance lab in, and by building the basic budget blocks like the displays, the furniture, the expected equipment outlay that's going to be required for the technology, and then the labor and so on, 
um, you can start to set some generic budget boundaries. And once that's done, then it really gets into the planning stages. And that's where we as a manufacturer start to see the schematic layouts that Eric's talking about that identify how many students can fit in the room, what the layout's going to be, and that's what we are using to budget. So we're providing budget numbers after the schematics are done, showing capacity inside the space. And then once all that's done, you, you essentially have a, a goal, a target fundraising goal to, uh, to achieve or a budget to, to work off of before then going out and committing to the various suppliers. Um, it's, there's, that process in itself takes you know, it doesn't, doesn't take place over a matter of two weeks or three weeks. It usually takes many months. You mentioned fundraising just now. Um, I was going to say, once you have the budget and your space and, and your idea of the quality of finishes established, I would strongly suggest to commission a, a schematic design for several reasons. For one, just a picture and, and a rendering uh, while it gives you an idea of what the space could look like. Sophisticated donors and sponsors always want to know where their dollars are going. For that purpose, uh, to have a design, a schematic design, in my opinion, is very important. The way I like to go about it is by preparing at least three different layouts. One, with a maximum number of students providing for the maximum number of students that the space can hold. The second one would be the optimum layout, optimal layout, what I consider the best layout. And then the third one typically becomes a hybrid between the two. It shows what a space, what the space could look like. The purpose of all of this is to go before a donor and say, here's our idea, here's the lab that we want to do. We can either make it for 20 students, or we can make it for 30 students if we cram them in. Uh, that becomes a, a business decision. Uh, I've often experienced it as that, because you can then say, well, the more students I get into the space, the more revenue I can generate from the lab, the more students I can enroll. And over a period of three, four years, uh, that amounts to a lot of uh, funds generated for the school. That's why I think it's important to have uh, as, as much supporting material as you can before you meet with the donor. And then, of course, you have to be um, you have to be reasonable, but you should be very aggressive in trying to raise as as much money as you can because if you don't raise enough. And then go back and say, well, we need a little bit more money. It just doesn't work that way. If you target more than you can probably use or more than you need, you can always backpedal a little bit and say, well, we don't need all that money, but we can do it with it for a little bit less. So, again, as much, the more supporting media that you have, I think the better chance you get. Uh, of realizing your project. Makes complete sense. Um, so, you know, in the very beginning you touched on, uh, you know, why a finance lab is different than a trading floor. And I'm curious, you know, from an architect perspective, if you're consulting a school or if a school comes and says, you know, hey, why shouldn't I just use my normal campus architects that are designing all the other computer labs on campus? How would you counter that as, you know, it, it's a really good thing to get somebody that specializes in trading rooms to make sure this room's put together uh, properly? Uh, yeah, my answer is I like to work with the local campus architect for two reasons. For one, uh, my expertise is in laying out um, a, a, a finance lab. Uh, and that is based on the experience that I've gained over doing 20 or so finance labs in the, in the past few years. That's something that I can pass on to the local architect who then would supervise the construction for, and, and possibly even do um, uh, contract documents. It doesn't pay for me to go all over the country to, to measure a room, to, to verify existing conditions, 
to then uh, prepare contract documents to supervise the bidding, it would cost too much in travel cost and it would just not be economical. That's why I limit myself to the initial phase, to the schematic design and design development. Schematic design, basically the layout of the, of the, seat, the seating layout. Design development includes uh, determining the finishes, determining the location of all the displays and also uh, power requirements for displays and uh, desktops and, and so on. That package I would then turn over to the local uh, architect, whether it's a campus architect or a hired architect, to uh, prepare contract documents and supervise the actual execution of, of, the, uh, of the project. That's the way I think, that's the most economical way to work. You draw on my expertise, but uh, you don't incur unnecessary costs where I cannot really contribute anything unique. And that's that's really the way I look at it. I'll add one thing. Go well. ahead. Um, a, training, a training environment is uh, in, in, the, in the real world, um, in the commercial world, is designed and laid out um, for maximum capacity, essentially. Um, and whereas in a finance lab, it's a combination of capacity as well as um, sort of a learning environment. And oftentimes people think of a learning environment as being all of the students facing the same direction, facing towards the front. And that's just not... Um, consistent with the layout of a of a finance a, a trading floor in the real world, so there has to be a a bit of a trade off in both directions. One one it has to somewhat emulate the environment which exists in a tr in a real trading environment, but at the same time not sacrifice too much the 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 traditions of of teacher student communication and interaction. So it's a combination of those two, um, and by doing it effectively and designing it effectively. Um, you can achieve both uh, very well, mm -hmm. and you can also use that layout and that, that concept to effectively make the most of the budget. Um, inefficient space planning um, can lead to cost overruns. It can lead to spending more money than you need to to achieve the exact same thing. And that's that's the balance, I think, that someone with Garrett's experience in the real financial trading world and, and myself can bring to a, a, a finance lab client that's looking to have a nice balance between the two. I think that's perfect, and it leads right into a question that came in from uh, one of our viewers. You know, what are some of the considerations that you design and uh, how you design a finance lab to accommodate multiple uses? So maybe not just finance, but entrepreneurial, corporate training, continuing education, things like that. Um, I'll start with you, Bruce. Any thoughts? You know, when people give you requirements around, you know, hey, it's more than just a trading room. Yeah. Um, First of all, the furniture that we make is is um, designed to be very robust um, because it typically take it typically takes a lot of abuse and it's used in high traffic areas and that's just that's the commercial world. In the higher education world, essentially, it's a public space. Um, so we build our furniture to be um, to have the durability of anything required to be used in a public environment. Uh, waves and waves of people coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. Um, the products that we sell into the finance lab, the, the, the trading desks that we sell in the finance lab, uh, are also convertible to uh, other types of applications. The exact same desks, for example, uh, Ryan, that we're sending out to these finance labs around the country are the same products that we sell um, on occasion into uh, libraries, like library reading tables, library lab tables. Um, they have the same strong aesthetic and the same uh, durability, the same cable management and so on. So they can be applied in both a, a trading simulated environment as well as a, a, a non-trading and more of a benching type environment as well. And it's just a matter of a couple of small modifications, a couple of the small additions uh, to, the, to the product that convert it to and from a trading desk and an open plan workstation. Okay. Um, and Gert, anything uh, I guess you'd have to add when people come to you about designing a multi-purpose space? 
Uh, well, let, let me just elaborate a little bit more on what Bruce just said. Uh, the finance lab desk that we developed uh, is unique in that it has better sight lines for the students and the instructors than any other desk on the market. That, that was the driving point behind the design. The same principle, obviously, is beneficial in any environment. The, the, the less obstruction you have, the less you can hide behind as a student behind a monitor or the more you have to crane your neck to look around a monitor, um, that's all detrimental to a, le a good learning environment. So we designed this desk to be basically a, 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 um, a very simple desk with excellent sight lines. Mm -hmm. That desk can now be used in any other environment because whether you have a computer lab or a general purpose uh, classroom, the better the sight lines, the more you can engage the student and, and vice versa, and then students with one another. So that's the major uh, advantage of this particular desk. It can be used in any environment, even, even though... <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, and, and specifically, I'm assuming the the key to that is navigating around monitors. Like, uh, is there a specific size of monitor that best fits with this desk design to optimize those sight lines? Uh, I wouldn't say that there is any real consensus about it. Uh, we designed, in, in our experience, a student position typically has two monitors. You can con consolidate those two monitors into one, in which case you can make the student position a little bit smaller. But that's basically uh, the, the base building block. Two monitors, 22 inches uh, maximum in this case, or a large 28-inch monitor. That's a function of how the instructor wants to communicate with the students. It uh, has nothing so much to do with design. We take that as, as one of the design parameters. What, what do you need? Do you need two 22-inch uh, two monitors? Do you need two larger monitors? In which case, you change the dimensions of the desk uh, and, and change the whole parameter. But, but those are things that we require, those are answers, rather, that we require from the, from the client, from the, from the dean or the instructor, whoever. And we can make recommendations. I mean, we, we have there's a general rule as to how how big certain equipment it is, and we can provide guidelines to to customers so that they can understand whether or not their existing equipment will fit effectively, mm -hmm. or the the new equipment that they plan on purchasing for the desktop. I'm speaking about monitors in particular, as long as they fit within a certain size. But the reality is that the majority of monitors, whether you're specifying 20, 22, or 24 inch monitors. Um, all fall within very similar overall dimensions. So uh, we, we think we have it accounted for, but like anything else, we always double check and, and provide those guidelines um, not to exceed, so to speak, mm -hmm. so that uh, clients are confident that what they get is going to be effective. Makes sense. Well, I'll shift gears just a little bit. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about trading desks. Uh, I've been in a few labs where it's more of a pod environment. What's your take on putting pods or, you know, not your typical bench desk when you're looking at a trading room? Uh, it, it depends entirely on uh, the instructor. Pods, when, when you say pods, you mean small team groups rather than a large, long desk? Correct. That's, a, that's entirely uh, up to the instructor. Personally, I think it makes a lot of sense to break up a space into small teams, four or six people. Now with this desk, you can see each other. You have visual access to one another. You can't hide behind the screens. And you have visual access to the instructor and to all the displays in front of the room. Now the instructor can go around and uh, tutor individual students. He can look at what they're doing on the computer. From that point of view, I think teamwork is is not only more interesting for the student, it's also beneficial to the student, to the whole learning process. So I would say uh, breaking up the entire layout into smaller clusters or pods 
makes a lot of sense. You have to have the space. Ultimately, it's, it's, it's the school that determines which way they want to proceed. Yeah, it's a factor also of just overall density and available space right. and required headcount. So if you, you can only, in a perfect world, we have lots of room to, to space out and, and to, to reposition, but you know, sometimes the limitations of the overall space will prevent the ability to break things up into pods. But you know, that's a factor of the space. That, that all comes down during the preliminary space planning and the mm -hmm. schematic design that you're talking about. That, that's what I was trying to drive at earlier. If you, uh, if I do a layout that, that shows the maximum number of students that the space can accommodate, and then another uh, juxtapose that against another layout that shows what I call the optimum. Optimum is usually it's always fewer people than the maximum, but that is uh, that would imply uh, breaking up the layout into pods or clusters. And again, it's not as efficient, space efficient. However, I think it is much more beneficial to the learning process than having a an institutional kind of layout. That um, just I'll just add to that that um, that kind of pod team based configuration is growing in popularity even in the commercial world. So you know, on your Wall Street trading floor five years ago, you'd have runs of trading desks that would seat anywhere from 18 to 30 people. Uh, and we're seeing that the, a lot of our clients now are breaking up their trading desk clusters into smaller pods of six to eight. Um, and they're sacrificing density, but they believe that they're getting better um, better individual contact and team building amongst those individuals. So it's not just in the finance lab environment where we're seeing that. We're seeing that in the commercial world too. Great. Any other trends you're seeing with just the desks and the furniture in general or anything else special that you know, advice that you know, people should kind of put in the back of their mind? I, I think the, 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 the low sight line desk that we've come up with um, is really sort of the, uh, the real unique driver and the real benefit to what we're providing. The furniture that we're providing is not, you know, I'll be the first to say, it's not, it's not meant to be like rocket science. It's meant to be smart, intelligent, efficient, um, you know, cost effective, uh, aesthetically stylish and, 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 and contemporary, but at the same time it should be able to deliver something that your regular table just doesn't deliver. And the ability to drop these screens and recess these screens into an environment that allows individual eye contact amongst users, as well as eye contact from the users to the front of the room or to the teacher or the display walls is really unique. And um, I'm not surprised that ever since we've started showing it uh, and opening it up to um, pros you know, prospective schools, that they, they tend to gravitate directly to that feature. Uh, above anything else, they're dr they're driving to the fact that it just it's, it, it it appears to be something unique and attractive, having that low 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 profile. So that to me has been uh, the biggest eye opener of any sort of small design introduction I've seen in the last five ten years. Great. Um, I'll shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about neat ideas. Like uh, I'll start with you, Bruce. You know, what's the neatest thing you've seen done in a trading floor or a trading lab, for that matter? You know, is there any really innovative or neat things just from a design perspective you've run into? There's, I could go on for hours on this. Uh, there, there's, no, there's no limit to man's creativity when it comes to tricking out furniture and environment, but depending on budget and, and the, 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 the feeling you're trying to generate in these rooms, there's a number of special things that we would consider and be willing to do, whether it's uh, incorporating um, uh, adjustable height whereby the furniture can actually be electrically adjusted in height for the users for an ergonomic benefit. Um, that is seriously going to increase the budget, but it's not something that we don't see in classrooms often today. We see a, a willingness to increase budget to incorporate that ability to have a sit-to-stand capability. Um, it, it does sort of eliminate the sight line concept, but the furniture can always be dropped down to its low position for, for teaching purposes, but for just general use purposes, having adjustable height, that's a nice that's a nice feature to have. But it is a budget impact. Other things like um, um, uh, you know specific or, or intelligent task lighting, uh, motion um, 
is important. Another one is you might see this more and more maybe five or ten years from now, but the federal government has actually passed what they call Title 24 regulations for electrical power consumption within furniture in the office in the built environment. And effectively, uh, what it means is that we can design our furniture so that um, a motion sensors at the desk can determine whether or not there is anyone actually at the desk. And um, if there's no one actually at the desk, it will power down the equipment or put it into a sleep mode so as to conserve energy. Um, this sounds like a nice to have right now, but uh, I'd say within the next 10 years, you'll see it on not just trading labs, but every single environment that we build furniture into. So that's a, that's a neat development that we're seeing that is. What if you fall asleep at the desk? Will it shut off power automatically? It'll sense your presence. Uh, okay. Sometimes the sensor is done overhead, sometimes the sensor is done under the work surface, so it can it can sense whether there's a body there within a within a certain distance. What can give you a uh, seat massage? Yes, well that would, that would, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> Those that are the things we're seeing right now that, that, are, that are certainly, um, uh, are, are they don't necessarily enhance the performance of the product, but it sends a statement, I think, to the student about the idea of conservation um, and, uh, and environmental stewardship and stuff like that, the kind of things that schools are supposed to be trying to transmit to the next class of, of, uh, you know, of, of grown-ups, so to speak. So it's one of those things that was Speaking of conservation, uh, a, a typical trading desk in the financial environment is, is five feet wide, five feet or sometimes six feet. A typical student environment is three feet wide. That's a conservation of space, but it, it also does something else. It brings the students closer together, and it brings the students closer to the displays and closer to the instructor, and ultimately it saves a lot of money. But aside from that, a finance lab desk serves the same function as a straight, as a, an old-fashioned trading desk does. Well, I, on that, I'll throw the same question to you, Gerd, that I threw to Bruce a minute ago. You know, you've designed a lot of interesting things. What's the most interesting obstacle or requirement or fun project you've worked on? Any uh, interesting tidbits you can leave for people? Uh, well, what comes to mind is one of my first projects was for a. Um, the college up, uh, upstate in New York, where the college had purchased an old school building from a high school, and in the process of converting it into the business school, there was one space left in the building that nobody could figure out a use for, and that was the old entrance lobby. Space about 30 by 30 feet. However, it was three feet below the general floor level of the building. On the other hand, the ceiling was four feet taller than the, than the uh, typical ceiling in the building. So we had a, a very interesting space, very voluminous. And in order to make it work, we, uh, in order to bring the floor level up to, at least at the entry point, to the general floor level, we installed tiers, actually three different levels. Uh, what that did, is it gave it more of a large trading room feeling where oftentimes you tear the floors when you, when you can do it. And it, it vastly improved the sight lines to the students. That was long before we developed this new desk. We um, used a uh, traditional desk there. But that was one of the most interesting uh, projects that I've done in that it was a very relatively small space, 30 students. But it was just a grand space as far as the uh, finance lab was concerned. That's great. Well, um, we're we're starting to wind down to the end here, and um, just have a couple of questions left. So uh, I do want to remind everyone: if you do have questions, feel free to put those in. We want to make sure and get all your questions answered uh, as we go through the conversation here. So again, we, we're definitely encouraging questions. Um, with that, I'll I'll throw. Similar question, but the opposite end of the spectrum, and I'll, I'll start with you, Bruce. You know, instead of the neatest thing, what are common mistakes? What are pitfalls? What are some of the things that you know somebody starting out right now? You could give them little bits of advice to uh, areas to avoid so that they're as successful as possible in implementing a lab. 
I think um, the, the as someone who's involved in the engineering and the manufacture of the product, uh, there's a occasionally there's a misunderstanding of what true dimensions uh, are available um, in um, in how big furniture is or how small the furniture can be. Oftentimes we get um, we get sort of these homemade space plans made up by someone at the school where they've drawn a, a piece of furniture and that's two feet two feet deep <laughs> and and five feet or six feet wide because they may have gone to me they may have measured an existing training table that they saw in some other lab that was <laughs> that dimension and they the assumption can be made that well, if that's two feet deep, then this should be two feet deep. Where, in fact, a finance lab requires a slightly deeper footprint for the furniture to accommodate the equipment. It's just, but but inches inches matter um, in a space uh, because there are there are realities in terms of clearance and egress and so on and space planning. You have to allow for a certain amount of space around the furniture to meet all sorts of codes. So the biggest mistake that I see and the things that we have to struggle with is is to pull client teams back in line with the realities of what the size of the furniture is and don't ever make any assumptions um, on dimensions mm -hmm. when it comes to space planning the furniture because you may find yourself, you may be putting yourself into a box and, and, and thinking that you were going to be able to get 40 people into a room and you can only actually get 30. Um, and that can be a, to me, is, a, is, a, is something that we struggle with, I'd say on every third or fourth project where the, the estimation of, of the budget was based on a certain layout, which is actually feasibly not possible. So that's, we like to sort of leave it to the, the space planning experts to show what's possible uh, before making any kind of assumptions on what can be done. Great. Gerd, anything to add to that? What uh, thoughts do you have in terms of common pitfalls or mistakes or advice you could leave people? Uh, one piece of advice that I like to give is don't lose control over your project. Uh, by that, I mean, uh, to give you an example, uh, when, it, when it comes to trading desks, to the purchase of, of student desks or trading desks, oftentimes uh, the purchasing department will get involved and not knowing what's required, they will order the least expensive product that they can think of, but they won't tell anybody about it. So. By the time the furniture rolls into the, the space, it turns out it doesn't fit uh, because somebody didn't pay attention. Or, uh, yes, it did fit, but it doesn't have any wiring capacity, at least not the ones, not the, the, the capacity that we require. Or there are other uh, dimensional issues um, that, that make it impossible. The more you get involved in the project, the more you stay involved in the project in, in terms of the details, the better off you are. It does not result, it won't result in cost overruns or delays, uh, and, you, and you get the product that you want. Yeah, it's really, it's really about making sure the, the specification, I'm speaking from behalf of the furniture side, is when we deliver a proposal of what we're providing, we're, based, we're providing it based on a well-thought-out and a well pre uh configuration of people, users, bodies, and equipment. And it's not simply transferable to a folding picnic table. It just can't. There is no easy way out of that. So having a, a clear and con concise specification of the performance of the furniture and that mandated requirement of what the furniture is supposed to do will help um, prevent, you know, we'll just say over-eager procurement departments from just going out and ordering something on, mm -hmm. online or something like that. It's, it's, the performance spec should be clear and written out and not just provided as a, as a diagram that shows rectangles referred to as desks. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good point because um, purchasing departments most often are required to bid a project, to bid furniture, for example. If you don't know what you're trying to purchase, you can't make an effective uh, bid, can't put together a bid. For that reason, a performance spec is always a desirable thing to have. You can then turn the performance spec over to purchasing and say, this is, these are the requirements, 
They can then turn it over to the various vendors and check to see if they can comply with the requirements or not. But uh, it's it's the quickest and the most expedient way to purchase furniture in, a, in an lab environment. Okay. We do have a question that came in asking about wireless and mobile components. Um, when you guys are faced with design questions around mobile, making things modular so they can move around and then leveraging wireless versus wired connections to the various electronic devices, any uh, thoughts, feedback, guidance on that question? I'll start with you, Bruce. Yeah, um, mobile devices are everywhere. Um, and incorporating mobile technology into the lab is um, something that we're, we already do it with our, with our Wall Street financial clients. Um, to certain, there are certain limitations in terms of what's, what's being designed, you know, what's being, what, what you're trying to do with it, but um, making the, um, the space more mobile is, it's somewhat in its infancy right now in the sense that um, the teaching environment likes to sort of have a structure to it in terms of the positioning of people. Uh, but uh, in terms of incorporating technology, um, mobile technology is, e is simpler and easier and, and cable free. So it's, it's not a difficulty on our side at all. It's more a matter of exactly how does the mobile technology impact the positioning and placement of the people. Um, you know, in, in theory, if, 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 you, if a trading floor could be run off of iPads, everyone could just be sitting on their couch. Um, but in the reality of a trading room, um, it's really more about what you're trying to achieve with, uh, uh, with mobile technology and how we, would, how we would address that. Great. Another question just came in here about suggestions for routing power and data for desktops. You know, do you suggest is going through floor, wall, ceiling? Any advice for people that are planning that? Um, floor, is, we'll with you. floor is always preferred. Floor is always preferred, but it can also come from the wall, and it can also drop down from a ceiling through power poles, although that's not desirable. No, that's not. I think the best solution is through the floor into the desk, and then lateral distribution within the desk. That way, everything is accessible, and you only have one entry point per cluster, which greatly reduces the number of, of floor uh, drills that you have to do in order to get power to each desk. So uh, power poles, uh, I personally hate, mm -hmm. because it's, it, it just interferes with sight lines. It's very simple. Uh, and it's not particularly aesthetically pleasing. But aside from that, uh, floor distribution on the floor and, and in desk distribution is the way to go. Great. Well, I think we're kind of at the tail end here. Um, just as a wrap up, I'd like to give each of you just an opportunity to kind of throw your closing thoughts in. You know, just 30 seconds, 60 seconds on, you know key tidbits or planning or advice to those that are out there looking at this concept right now of adding a trading room, you know, what, what are your key takeaways? I'll start with you, Bruce. I'd like to, again, being a manufacturer, um, uh, this type of furniture is not um, sitting on a shelf in a warehouse being distributed on a daily basis. It's made to order. Uh, most office furniture is made to order. Um, but certainly this type of product is made to order and uh, which involves lead times both for production, design, um, uh, finalization, color selection and so on. Um, oftentimes, typically in the finance lab, there's a, there's a set period of time when an installation is going to take place, either over a holiday or in the summertime, which is very common. Um, planning, planning, effective planning of knowing when the furniture from my side, which is a, which is a large portion of the product, um, should be planned on effectively. Um, it's if you start thinking about furniture three or four weeks before you move in, um, you're going to be renting furniture. Um, the, the real process you should allow yourself. You know the, the the planning should start six to nine months before you expect to move in, if not longer, uh, and the uh, the preparedness of purchasing furniture for the finance lab three months 
before move-in is a safe bet. But that means you've already made your decision on all the details, right? So the the you know it takes several months to get consensus on on layouts, finishes, and so on. Um, so the proper planning is really important to get the best quality room. Uh, we've all seen clients that have just let it go so long, and um, once they realized that all the stuff they really wanted to buy to be in by August, they couldn't get. They couldn't get it. They had to go get the, the third or fourth best thing that was available on the market at that particular time, and they didn't get what they wanted. So um, plan your plan your development and your sign-off process uh, in line with the real the real world lead times of the products you're about to buy. Great. And to you, Gerd, closing thoughts, key takeaways. Uh, spend as much time as you can on the initial phases of the project. That is the, the schematic design and the design development. That's where you make all the decisions uh, that eventually you want to see executed in, in, in the actual project. The more time you, and effort you spend, the more involved you are in the beginning phase, the better the project. Uh, and the actual preparation of contract documents doesn't take all that long. But to come to a consensus about what the room should do, what it should look like, and what it should cost, uh, that's where you as the client should really be deeply involved uh, on a continuing basis. That, that's it. Perfect. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, well, uh, I don't see any other questions that have come in. I really appreciate your perspectives and taking the time to share with us, both Bruce and Gerd. You know, it's a, been an invaluable session. And I'll just remind everyone out there that uh, is watching this, if you're attending AACSB, stop by the Finance Lab booth, check out all of the things we talked about, you know, desks, monitors, simulation, tools, uh, displays, tickers, you name it. It'll all be showcased at the AACSB that'll be April 26th to the 28th in Tampa. Um, as well, as if you're watching a recording of this, if you've got questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Check out all the great resources on the University Finance Lab website. You know, it's out there to hopefully help you in planning and preparing for all the things that uh, you're looking to do when you implement your Finance Lab. So again, thanks everyone for attending, and uh, we look forward to working with you.